Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. <clears throat> we are so happy to have everyone here tonight. Before we launch into a discussion of Rachel Eliza's new collection, Seeing the Body, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 93 years, Strand is the sole survivor and still run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are excited to have with us Rachel Eliza Griffiths, who is celebrating the release of her new poetry collection, Seeing the Body. Oh, sorry, I think I froze there for a second. So tonight, we are excited to have with us Rachel Eliza Griffiths, who is celebrating the release of her new poetry collection, Seeing the Body. Eliza is the author of four previous collections of poetry, including Lighting the Shadow. Her literary and visual work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Paris Review, and many other publications. Joining her in conversation tonight is poet Natalie Diaz. Natalie was born and raised in the Fort Mojave Indian village in Needles, California, on the banks of the Colorado River. Her first collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, was published by Copper Canyon Press, and her second book, Postcolonial Love Poem will be published by Grey Wolf Press, or was published in, by Grey Wolf Press in March 2020. She is a 2018 MacArthur Fellow, as well as a Lannan Literary Fellow and a Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellow. She was awarded the Princeton Holmes National Poetry Prize and a Hoder Fellowship. She is a member of the Board of Trustees for the United States Artists, where she is an alumni of the Ford Fellowship. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Eliza and Natalie. Cool. Hey, thank you so much, Sabir, and thank you to The Strand, and thank you to everyone, and most especially thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm just in this virtual ecosystem, girl. I'm just like, <laughs> hey. <laughs> and um, I was so happy when The Strand asked if they could host a conversation and thought of you and just was like, let's do it. And so, um, I thought, you know, today's Friday, it's like Friday, you know, so I want to have that Friday theme of like, you don't have no job and you ain't got shit to do Friday. Like, we just, <laughs> were, were you text me, like were you text me at 2 a.m. and say, are you still out? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I thought, you know, we'll read some poems and talk about sisterhood. Um, talk about so much going on in the world and where we are and how we're loving, how we're grieving and all of that kind of thing. And then we'll open it up um, toward the end of the combo. Uh, Sabir told me there are a lot of poet family up in the house. A lot of Kian is listening in. So I'm really, really excited um, that we're all gathered Friday and that we're safe and we're alive and we can gather and hold space together. And so, um, what I thought uh, we'd do is maybe we'd start each of us reading a poem and then we could talk about our books. Check it out. This is Postcolonial Love Poem. Get this now from Grey Wolf if you don't. But I feel like everyone has it and they should. And so um, I'm really happy this is my pub week and getting in a virtual way to celebrate with, with you and so many amazing people who love me and love and live like in our circle and our tribe feels really good and special. There's so many names in the room and energy coming into the room. And I know you're like, what time is it there? Uh, it's, it's after four. Okay. It's, it's quitting time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll read a poem and then, um, and then you'll read a poem and then yeah we'll just start yeah we'll just we'll flow do what we always do yeah <laughs> <laughs> we'll do what we do and um let it flow and you know we'll ride like we ride <laughs> <laughs> um so this is my new book seeing the body and um it's out by norton and i'm still getting used to holding it and finding poems in it um and i thought what i'd do was read uh, the last poem actually, which seems weird, but to read the last poem in it, and I, I'm reading it um, because I think 
it speaks in a way to your last poem, Grief Work. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's um, a, like a cipher happening there and thought we could talk about what grief work is because grief work is grief work, but also love. And if your book is about so many things, but love I know is a spine for me, reading it and rereading it now. And then I thought we'd talk about fun things like the covers of our books and all kinds of stuff like that and whatever else we decide to go off on. Um, and also I wanna to say too, before I read this poem, Natalie and I were texting uh, like a while ago, like an hour ago, and um, Natalie reminded me that four years ago on this day, we were together and the Pulse nightclub shooting happened. And it actually happens that Natalie, myself, poet sister Camila Aisha Moon and poet brother Christian Campbell, we were all together that night. And so thank you for bringing that memory up into this space because it's really important. It's pride. There's so much going on. Um, I haven't seen as much stuff about it, what happened at Pulse, but I want to I thank you for remembering and bringing that in the space today. Um, this is a poem. It's called Good Death. And um, when my mother died, uh, some people asked me uh, if my mother had had a good death, and I didn't really know what that meant at that time, um, and had to do a lot of research actually to really figure out like complicated grief and what a good death means. Um, and I've been thinking about what that means, especially right now in America, what a good death is. Good death of words placed in their best black clothes, of that darkness full, of my mother's laughter forged of great dust that spilled its golden light into her tomb, of the copper wreath carved upon her copper vault. God and mother, I must speak to you. I must say it is good, our death of the ivory city bones like trumpets blowing my mother away from me in song of the city again where doves and vultures welcome my mother's life of the road between her dates a short slash a bridge ends in oblivion mother you never end of the pronunciation of sorrow forever mine each astonishing summer of the snake who suffered our story of knowledge and shame of the afterlife and its downpour of ordinary rights, of the ordinary rights I enact in my broken thoughts, of my fever waving its anguish until the match goes out in disbelief, of Michael Brown bleeding without mercy beneath the concrete roof of God of God, God, and God, of the peace and suffering Black people have been promised, of the clean white clothes I gave my mother's undertaker. Here are the stockings I said, not knowing whether they would match my mother's skin or death, of the poems I've been trying to say, die, I say, go elsewhere for songs. And I'm just, I'm going to close it there because it's a, it's a longer poem and I really want us to have time to talk. Um, but I just want to just have some poetry in this space because that makes sense. Um, do you want to share something from post-colonial love poem and say anything? Thanks, Emma, for having me. I think we just glitched right there. But mm -hmm. um, no, it's, it's, it's lucky to be here with you and to celebrate your book and and like you say, just I think all the moments we we can manage of of love or connection, um, and like you mentioned earlier, we we were once um, four years ago uh, around this time heading in for a reading. I I think I picked Christian up. Christian was in Philly then, and we picked up Isha on the way and and met you. And then we we rode the night a little bit that night, and uh, I remember driving Christian, I dropped uh, dropped him off at his cousin's and that's when we heard the news break. And I 
I kept thinking about what it had meant for, for me to have just been with my people, with my family, um, and to imagine if, if that had happened to us when we were in one of those spaces we had been in earlier that evening. Um, mm. And so thinking about it again, I, I was texting you and also Christian and just kind of remembering that and thinking, you know, all these ways we've been woven together sometimes stick out more than anything, like the scars, the wounds, but there's so much more, right? That there's, there's everything around those that are also kind of joining us. Um, so the poem that you asked me to read, Grief Work, it's a poem that has developed in direct conversation with you, with talking with you about your mother, um, and also all of the ways that your work about uh, your mother have also given me another relationship with my own mother. You know, like I remember, um, we, well, you and I had leaned on each other pretty, pretty hard one summer, and we were talking. I was, I was back on my reservation, and, and you were in New York, and you and I had been having some conversations, and my, my mother had asked about you, and I had, my mother's never met you, but I told her, you know, she knows a lot about you, so when she hears me mention you, she has a knowing of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, she asked me, I stepped outside and she asked who I, was, who I was speaking with. And I said, you know, it was uh, Eliza. And, and so we talked a little bit, but there was something, I'd been having a conversation with you about this missing, this missing of your mother. And my mother said to me something she'd never said to me ever before. And she kind of just paused and she said, I miss my mother every day of my life. Every day since I lost my mother, I've missed her every day. And so, you know, there was something in what you've shown me of grief that is also love that I was also able to, to connect with my mother about. Um, and it showed me it's a love that surpasses all of these ways we've been taught love. And so I think a lot about that. And so this poem is, is about that. It's about imagining a kind of sisterhood, uh, a kind of relationship among us that is also care. You know, the way the ways we grieve is also the ways we care for one another. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is a and it's the final poem of my of my book, um, which feels again like a, a beginning. Yeah. Grief work. Why not now go toward the things I love? I have walked slow in the garden of her, gazed the black flower dilating her animal eye. I give up my sorrows the way a bull gives its horns, astonished and wishing there is rest in the body's softest parts. Like Jacob's angel, I touched the garnet of her hip and she knew my name and I knew hers. It was auxochromo, it was chromophoro, it was Eliza. When the eyes and lips are brushed with honey, what is seen and said will never be the same. So why not take the apple in your mouth in flames and pieces straight from the knife's sharp edge? Achilles chased Hector around the walls of Ilium three times. How long must I circle the high gate between her hip and knee to solve the red gold geometry of her thigh? Again, the gods put their large hands in me, move me, break my heart like a clay jug of wine, loosen a beast from some dark long depth. My melancholy is hoofed. I, the terrible, beautiful lampon, a shining devour horse tethered at the bronze manger of her collarbones. I do my grief work with her body labor to make the emerald tigers in her throat leap, lead them burning green to drink from the deep violet jetting her breast. We go where there is love, to the river, on our knees beneath the sweet water, I pull her under four times until we are rivered, we are rearranged. I wash the silk and silt of her from my hands. Now who I come to, I come clean to, I come good to. Oh, oh my gosh, thank you. Yeah, I was thinking of like, like the idea of goodness there mm -hmm. at the end and like that grief has always been, again, something that we thought of as a, as a negative, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think there's a way that, that grieving uh, is, is also like helping us um, 
even though it is the thing we're grieving and, and that thing can be a violence, uh, it's also that grieving that, that helps us not become the violence. You know, we, we can be clean of it and ourselves again, in a way. No, mm -hmm. oh, I really love that. And I think, you know, when I, when I think of the years now um, that we've been so fortunate to, to orbit each other and be in each other's lives, this kind of constant reverence for um, the earth, for the desert, for the river, and I know in seeing the body, you know, landscape is really critical um, to how I'm coming through the grief of my mother, but also held within that earth by um, the people who love me and call me beloved. And so, um, you know, I want us to talk a little bit maybe about that intuition. Um, and suddenly I'm thinking, of, of our beloved Joy Harjo and just like the heart and the mind and how for me and my practice, you know, while I see that they are distinct, they're inseparable for me in the practice and the making. And I feel over the years, one of the deep pleasures um, I have when talking to you is about making, like, let's draw, let's make pictures, let's write, like the page is happening in us, but it's elsewhere. And um, I just wanted to ask you, and I know that you and your beloved are in the desert and you're growing vegetables and food and, and just, and doing puzzles and like just, you know, enjoying the moonlight. And I feel as though that is such a, a valid and true and necessary radical action in the midst of what we are calling protest. And so to protest through loving feels wonderful and this is you know this is audrey lord this is june jordan this is joy harjo this is you know lady long soldier it's, it's just everybody and so i just wondered you know how is that feeling in you manifesting right now um in the space that you're at you know i'm in new york and it's helicopters it's still very quiet and haunted here um, I don't feel as free in my body to move through nature in a way I might at this point in June. How is it for you, Natalie? Yeah, I, I mean, we're really lucky to be out here. Um, and again, we came out here before things hit because mm -hmm. my, my mom had like a medical emergency. So my, mo my mother is diabetic um, mm -hmm. and uh, she had a wound that her body went septic and so we we rushed here and we ended up staying and you know we've been here since and this was I think toward the end of February mm -hmm. and um I mean it's it's lucky it's lucky to be out here for so many reasons we are also being hit pretty hard by by COVID um and so you know our our res has uh, the Fort Mojave res where I grew up has declared a state of emergency um we have uh our neighbors up the road at Wallapai, mm -hmm. um, you know, have had over, over 10 deaths and, you know, 90 cases in a population of 2,300 people, mm. you know, and so, and everyone's working really hard to protect our elders, um, you know, because we live, we live with a certain understanding of elders here that yeah. Amer America clearly doesn't. Um, and, and I, I think that's also a connection. So I don't mean to leap too far from land and, and elder, but, but I know to be connected to my land from what my elders have taught me, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I mean, I think too of a lot of your work in, in Mississippi and all of, all of the ways, like when you were in a place, you'd go out, like when we were in New Mexico and like, you know, getting out into the land and, and, and really like asking the land to kind of welcome you as you ar arrive in a place. And, and with that comes like some terrible histories, right? Some terrible uh, knowings and knowledges. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think there's something, I mean, we, we're seeing so many systematic structures, right? Of our country, but systematically they want to disconnect us from, from mm -hmm. that land. Um, and it's lucky being with Sreda. Sreda, who I also met on an, a wild night out with you all. That was that magical night when, it was blizzarding and uh, it was one of those nights where I get like a text. At, at, <laughs> it, it, this might have been, this was like two, three-ish maybe. And I was like, hey, you still out? Where are you? And I look up and there you all were at the, the doorway of the Blue Note. <laughs> Being like, come on, he's letting us all in, come on. 
that jazz, that jazz, Armana. Uh, was know, a Lisa, Lisa Fisher night. <laughs> Lisa Fisher. Mm. Yes. I know. I, I was like ready for love after that. Um, but no, I mean, you know, it, I, I think there's something, um, you know, that, They've, they've wanted to kind of disconnect us, but like Soretta, bringing Soretta, who's from the East Coast out to my, my desert and to watch her, because her people are from a farm in Mariana, Florida. Um, yeah. Or, or Lamar, yeah. Lamar's family and her family are from the same place. Um, yes. So, yeah, I mean, it, it just, it's lucky we're developing a relationship. I think there's so many relationships of love and there's one that she and I are, are developing uh, which feels like a recovered language, like we're recovering it from places mm -hmm. that have been, um, have, have been kind of, uh, you know, intentionally taken, taken away from us. Um, and, and kind of thinking about that, thinking about these different ways of language. Um, and I don't know if you want to like move into reading another poem or, I mean, I think, you know, we started off kind of talking about this idea of the language of love and grief and how close they were and and i was recently talking to another friend we have in common um you know uh, roger reeves so roger's like i mean you know you guys are like some of my best friends uh in the world much less poetry you know um mm -hmm. poetry is a small blip i feel like in in what yeah. we all have and we were talking a little bit too just about you know having gone through covid and now we're now we're returning into what we've, we've been calling covid and, and also this, uh, this great surge of energy, right, against what's been happening to black men and women and children, um, you know, since the beginning of America. And mm -hmm. these, these new ways of, of resisting, and not just resisting, but like coming to the other side of it. So not just fighting back, but also imagining beyond it, like being unwilling anymore to, to try to improvise in the situation, but to say, no, we want something more. Mm -hmm. and, I, and one of the things that Roger and I have been talking a little bit about is thinking about how are we coming out of this changed in relationship to our language? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what are all the things we, we didn't say that we now know we should have said? Or what were those questions that we weren't asking that, were, that now I, I, will, I will be determined to ask? You know, like, so I think there, there are just some interesting ways to think about uh, a lexicon, whether it's a return to, to something old, but maybe less about time, but more about maybe what I failed to, to ask or to say. Um, and so I'm wondering just how you're thinking about language right now. Um, yeah, you know me, that's like my wild, native, non-linear, supposed to be short question. <laughs> I'm all about it. And I, I'm all about the non-linear, as you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, language, you know, um, we, you know, we work at it, we, you know, we climb into it, and we try to occupy it and use it and dismantle it and disassemble it. And I think, like you and like Roger, um, lately, I have really personally taken myself to task to think about moments when I needed to say something and what were the forces or context around why I chose silence or just felt I couldn't speak um, and how silence happens on the page in a poem, but also how it happens in a room with our bodies, um, with what is at stake in this room, um, what is the hunger in this room, um, sometimes often what is the starvation in this room, um, what is the crumb I'm being offered and what am I negotiating for that. When I really think about language, something that I've always, in my, um, my photographer's body, I've always been at odds with the violence of the photographer's language, which is, you know, shooting, taking, capturing. I'm very reluctant to use those words when I'm making photographs. I don't want to shoot somebody or go to a shoot or take someone's picture. Um, I've always been resistant to that, but I do feel, um, especially as I was working through this book, that I really had to question the language that I was trying to um, push through this new body without my mother, like without her labor. 
and what did that what would that mean and and how I would have to come outside of that veil of that language and like be very vulnerable and to literally put my body as an image but also as a text together in a thing and be like here's a book um and that felt really challenging to me um as I'm looking now you know in so many spaces of black brown um trans trans like the language that you think is sanctioned for someone else, it's not sacred for it, like it obliterates, it kills them. Um, it kills us. And so um, my tongue is trying to do a different thing and really be mindful. Um, Cause I, it's in my heart, but then I think, oh, I just said that and that's fucked up. Like, that's not it, that ain't it, don't say that. And, um, trying to think about those moments and come to terms when I've been in a room and um, made an effort to see, like not made an effort, but like seeing someone else and really knowing like our position in that room and then being like, no, we can't have this anymore. We just, we're not gonna have it. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think like you, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about these things, um, you know, at the age we are and for years, it's years now that we've been friends um, with our, our folks and our circle now. Um, Wait, what, what are you saying about the age we are? Don't be talking we about fine. We fine. Don't crack. We, mm, the age, you know, the, the, the fineness of the wineness. Um, but just that we have poets behind us and poets ahead of us, right? And that wave and how it turns and curves under and like, people who have curved under that we've lost like elders, as you mentioned. And there's, there's even elders now is looking at things like elders who are still incarcerated because they did civil rights actions. And um, they still don't have justice and they're elders now. And they were our age when they did the, those acts of justice and fought for what they needed to. And so thinking above that, um, I feel right now really called to to just say the thing, as you were saying, just to say it and not to let a moment go by without saying, oh no, like we just, mm -mm, that's no. Um, to say no and to say yes. Um, and to ask questions in a different, difficult space where someone might think, oh, you're supposed to be nice or grateful or whatever, but say, well, actually, no. Like, I can't be grateful for, you know, the, the, boot, the boot on my heart. I'm not gonna do it, you know? Yeah, I, there's, um, I mean, I, you know me, like, I'm always in a bunch of conversations. So I, I, and I feel like I'm just always taking one conversation to, to the next. And mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had the luck of being in conversations with some incredible uh, Native scholars, uh, Brian Brayboy, Megan Bang, and mm -hmm. it's something we've been talking about. And it, it, it reminds me one of what we're seeing happen. Um, but also, I think, it, in the ways we've lived and the ways we've been able to practice as poets, but in and just in thinking to uh, reading your book and and realizing, you know, uh, like who am I, who am I as a daughter when my mother has passed? Um, and and there's a way that we've really been pressuring and talking and thinking about this idea that says like we've always been we've always been descendants and been treated as descendants, mm -hmm. but it's time now for us to start acting like the ancestors. Yeah. And I mean, I think in many ways we do, right? Like in, you know, we, many of us are just born old with, with our ancestors in us, like, you know, because it's the way we, we survive. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's something about that, that is, we're seeing it now, like we're seeing our young people not wait for us to tell them, you know, what is right, uh, mm -hmm. what is the right way to do something. We're seeing them just understand that they have a legacy or where their, you know, their places and all of this. And mm -hmm. I know that's something that, that I feel uh, throughout your book, um, throughout seeing the body is just beginning to understand what it means to stand differently now. Mm -hmm. You know, not, I mean, your mother will always be with you and, and those we've lost are always with us in some way, but also to realize like, wait, now what is my place? Mm -hmm. What is the energy I need to carry forward? Um, and so, it's it's been uh, very generous to spend time in your book and to and to also have you know this other mm -hmm. relationship with you and with our community and all the different families um, mm -hmm. we bring together. I'm I'm also seeing too that uh, just that Severe was letting the attendees know if they have questions to 
to go ahead and drop them in. So um, I'll just mm -hmm. kind of say that out loud too. So if anybody's there watching, um, you know, mm -hmm. they want to they want to put some questions in, we'll we'll slip into that soon. So yeah. But, yeah, I was thinking just what you said about that kind of moment where you kind of you know you come through something and you do stand in the place. And I remember my mother my mother died, and then like seven days after her death, Mike Brown was murdered. And I feel like that was a moment for me where I was in this inside of this very intimate grief and suddenly again, again and again and again in this country, I now have to pull and internalize and metabolize this violence inside of me. And I remember it was kind of at that point that I remembered literally like getting dressed, getting my cameras all strapped on and, you know, walking into New York walking to Times Square, walking to Grand Central with my hands up. And I thought, I'm prepared now for whatever happens. I'm prepared to be arrested. I'm prepared to lay down on this floor in Grand Central with these police, with these German shepherd dogs. I, I don't, I can't, I can't. Like, it just broke, it broke me. Um, and I think right now too, with, with COVID, with having so many, so many members of our community, you know, my uncle, a, a week ago yesterday, he died, my uncle Mark, he was my mother's last living brother. She has one sibling who is alive now, and then that will be it. And so this also, this, mor this mortality, um, coming to grips with that and thinking about blood and, um, you know, I know in your first book and in this book now, you really open up the notion of blood and how blood is, you know, chosen, blood is spilled, blood is loved and cherished, um, how it flows through the body, how it sings, how it is a horn. Um, and I think there is always something that people, it, it, it pulls us into this space of knowing um, that is really necessary and, and, and is part of our humanity and di dignity of when you see somebody else, no matter where you are, this is a human being, period, like period. And so, you know, I have to say sitting here like Brianna Taylor, say her name. It's not right. Don't pass a law, but don't do the justice. Don't do that. Um, and this stuff, it's, you know, I think of Baldwin toward the end of his life, how bitter he was how you would see the videos of him in his eyes and his body, and it was devouring him. And yet he was on that threshing floor of truth. And we're all on that threshing floor now. And it's, it's like, there's no more time for you to decide. I can be woke, but, or I can be this and that. Like, you know, you're, you're there or you're not. And if you aren't there, get educated and leap. Leap like we've been leaping and running for our lives, you know? And standing up and I remember not to go on too long but years ago I think we did something at maybe it was Dodge Poetry Festival or something and you talked about warriors and I I feel um so grateful at this time you know our books I feel like warrior sisters all the time with you um but you know this space of warriors in community and seeing these young people and I think of them as warriors I think that they're doing something um in the community that um we've always had warriors but now it's just this like unrelenting power and i love it and, and bringing love toward that yeah and i mean and i'll we'll turn to questions shortly and, and I'm, I'm thinking about that moment of when we were together in what dodge is in jersey right yeah jersey, yeah, yeah. um and pat roselle i think was there too i yeah. maybe, you know, no, maybe yeah um oh shoot like it got Look, from that's Seattle. that 40-year-old brain. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but like it was crazy because we were in a school and their mascot was like this like native figure was like, you know. And so it was weird me sitting there in this room with no natives in it with this big mascot on the wall. But yeah. I mean, there's something too like uh, about warriors that in, in, in Mojave culture, you know, we, our, our warriors were also... Um, I'll use the, this is not my language, but this is my elder, my teacher Hubert. He said that warriors were were the great Mojave gentlemen. Like we tend to think of our warriors only as those who are are fighting. So we've we've kind of violenced them, but they were also the the ones who cared 
they're great caretakers of the land. Um, you know, they're great caretakers of, of um, like plants and trees and all of the things they, they would then, t you know, use as tools to defend or to, you know, in, uh, to go to war. But they also like cared greatly for the people. And I think that's something that, that we're also forgetting when we're talking about all of these warriors who are out there, you know, doing things so that I, I can be a poet across the desert, you know, um, and who are out there in the midst of COVID marching mm -hmm. and doing these things. And it really is like, I think asking all of us, okay, like, you know, uh, what is like, we say in Mojave, what is the next best thing that I can do? And so I think we're kind of, uh, you know, at that point. And it's a hard question, I think, for poets, because mm -hmm. I don't think just writing a poem is going to be enough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, I mean, we're kind of, it's kind of a weird place to transition, right? But I want to make sure I, I at least stick a little closely to, uh, you know, seeing if the, the audience has audience. I don't even know what, it, what is the audience. If, if any of like your friends out there, if our friends out there, um, you know, or even like new, new strangers who will become friends later have questions that they want to ask you about, um, about seeing the body, about your work, about any of the things we've talked about. Sure. Yeah, let's, let's transition. And I also want to just give some love to, to, I have family watching and that always feels special to me um, because I haven't got to see my family and be near them. And so um, I just want to thank them. But yeah, let's, I think we have a lot of love and questions and things happening. So I don't know, I think Sabir might come back with, for to help us or. Hi, sorry. Just no took a second. But oh, so our first question is actually from Facebook and it's from Aaron who wanted to know what was the genesis of, of, sorry, I'm going to rephrase this slightly. What was the genesis that led to creating, writing, seeing the body? Um, the genesis was, was grief, was that my mother died in 2014. And so um, it took me some time to really want to attach a narrative or language um, to that kind of inarticulate space. But once um, I felt that I even could write a poem uh, or use language or images or something toward rebuilding my own body, but kind of building this body of text and conversation um, privately and then publicly, that, that's how I, I started to create Seeing the Body. So that's the kind of real spinal cord of the book is, is, the, is the loss of my mother. Got it. And then the next question from Facebook is from Dana, who asks, what are poems which are getting you through this time? And this is directed at both you and Natalie. Natalie, do you want to? Oh, no, you, I think you should, you should go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lucille Clifton always. I'm reading Lucille Clifton. I'm reading Joy Harjo. I'm reading Henry Dumas. Um, I'm reading also my contemporaries, which I feel honored. Like we're really, we're, something is happening and coagulating in us where, maybe not coagulating, but it's like this current of blood in us. So, you know, R.S. Elise Garmai, Camilla Aisha Moon, Roger Reeves, Philip Williams, Ricky Laurentis, Ross Gay, Terrence Hayes. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, oh yeah, come in, there's just so, Jericho, you know, there's so many, Patricia Smith, there's so many poets, and I just flip around. Um, I don't, I, I pick up books. Um, Nandi Comer has a, a book, Krista Franklin, um, Tommy Blount, it's just a lot of beautiful people from so many different chords writing right now. Um, and just thinking suddenly of like Brian Bearheart, like I just is it's yeah all of these energy is coming together, and so um, I'm reading a lot, and then um, I'm looking at a lot of visual work too, and reading essays, um, thinking of Reginald Dwayne Betts right now, and you know Felon, and just just a lot. So I'm always reading. I I um kind of pick things up and put them down, and it's more like a into intuitive thing where something will come into me that I didn't even know I needed. Baldwin's always nearby, Toni Morrison. Um, 
uh, Wanda Coleman right now I'm reading. And so Etheridge Knight, I'm always reading. Natalie, what about you? Uh, I'm, I mean, I think the ones you named right now are just like great. I think that's like a perfect way. Um, and, and I'm saying that because I see their, I don't, since when am I like an administrator? I don't know what happened, but I'm like, I'm seeing other questions here. And I, um, I mean, and a couple of them, I think would, I'm also like interested in hearing what you say. Like, so someone's asking about like the book cover. Um, yeah. Someone else is asking too, just about working between between mm -hmm. mediums. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about that, I think yeah. that would also be really lucky for us to hear. So I'll, I'll tell that I would love to tell the book cover story because um, every time I see the book cover, uh, Natalie, you're a part of it, as you know. Um, so here's my book. We didn't get the tech together, so I couldn't really show you the actual thing, but this is this is the book cover. And um, on this day, literally a few feet away from me, Natalie was helping me that day. Um, we were in uh, Plaza Blanca, uh, just outside Abiquiu in uh, New Mexico. And um, I was out there to to um, teach at IAIA and I'd come out a bit earlier to spend time with Natalie and we went into the desert and so um, I had my camera on a tripod and this is a structure of kind of white volcanic rock and I ended up climbing up into this um, kind of almost womb um, or windpipe or throat uh, and it was very physical and it scraped me up and it was, um, I mean, I'm looking at this picture and just all I can think of is I was drenched in sweat. And I was like, Natalie, don't let me die and fall out of this <laughs> high ass <laughs> rock. And um, the cover is that, you know, being able to climb into such a space, but also to be held by a sister, but to also be held by the earth. And I love that there's sky visible in the cover. Um, I think there's something about that and then I also will just say um, in the book as well, there's, there's also this image, which you can't really see, but Natalie's cell phone is there and I left it. So I have a version where I edited it out, but- I was always messing things up. <laughs> <laughs> for the book, I actually wanted her cell phone to be there because that's, it's like, this is my time and she was there and she was present when I dared to kind of climb up into this thing that could have, I don't know how it could have come out. And it was such a stormy, wild day where it was raining and it was dramatic and the desert is so gorgeous. And in my grief, the desert was like the best place for me to be. And my sister knew that. And so um, I, that, that's, that's a short cap of, of the story of the book cover. So Natalie is, is my photo assistant, I would say, <laughs> and helping yeah. me with the cover. <laughs> Carrying yeah, I remember. So muck, muddy, remember? Oh well, gosh, it was so red. I remember. That we were the color like, of that earth, you know? I know. I was just running around like a little goat out there in the wash and you were doing all the real work. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember, and like, and you come, with, you come away with all these beautiful photos and then I, with my, you know, handy cell phone, I think I had a bunch of like, uh, my converse walking through the wash because it, it had rained there had been some rain so mm -hmm. uh, the wash was wet and had some some water streaming yeah. through so yeah yeah are there other questions to be oh yeah Sabir, go ahead. the uh, next one is you both work in multiple art forms wonderfully can you discuss how photography and poetry, poetry and oral histories inform both of your arts? Does that conversation between the various arts inform how you view and communicate in the world? Wow, okay. It's a double hitter. It's good, it's a great question. Um, Natalie, do you wanna say, any, do you wanna start? I, I mean, I'll have, I, have, I have low tech language for this. Um, I, I think a lot about a poem and an image, like I'm thinking of a photograph, for example. I'm thinking lately more so thinking about them in relationship to time and mm -hmm. what that means, um, what it means that we attempt to mark time with an image. Mm -hmm. um, and then where our, where our bodies kind of uh, exist either within or without that text or that image or 
you know, maybe thinking of a poem as an image or thinking of, of course, a photograph as a type of text, something we, we read emotionally or we read uh, sensually somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those are, the, those are the ways I'm trying to question or connect them. I, you know, I think it's something, um, I'm even thinking in your previous book, um, you know, Light in the Shadow, like how I actually felt image and text happening. It, it was a physicality, like the flickering, uh, you know, that was happening there. Um, and I mean, and especially I think considering how you uh, use the like landscape as the image, body, you know, and like what that relationship is, body of text, you know, body of land, um, you know, our own bodies, bodies of memories, bodies of loss. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually more interested in hearing you talk about it than uh, mm -hmm. just me formulating new questions along the way. Uh, no, I, I think I'm, you know, I'm thinking so much about photography and particularly video videos. Um, a few days ago, I put out a kind of like quirky video that was a lyrical associative kind of thing about some of the themes and seeing the body. But right now what I'm, I'm thinking about is like my reluctance right now to photograph protest and protesters. Um, and I'm also thinking about how justice seems to only be happening because the evidence of the photograph or the video has in some way um, overridden, like it's a certain kind of proof that seems to override a human voice saying this happened to me, um, this man was murdered, Th this man, unless the public sees another man kneel on another man's neck, they can't believe it. A black man's neck, they can't believe it. Uh, since 2014, I'd photographed protests. I went to the inauguration. I went to these different spaces. I wanted to see and engage and do it. And so for some reason, um, and I'm not sure, and I'm still exploring why, I want something else or something that else is at stake. And I have not yet watched the George Floyd video. I can't, I just, I can't. And I remember a few years ago for Black Poets Speak Out, I made a video um, based upon an Amiri Baraka poem um, incident. And after, you know, when I was making that, it made me sick because there was so much footage of violence and then it was like trying to curate the violence. And I thought, I, I'm not doing that again. I'm not, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And so um, I'm more interested now in actually like uh, black, brown bodies in joy, in love and peace. Um, but at the same time, I do realize the necessity of having the technology is, is like a jury or a judgment or a justice in a way. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, when certain videos just automatically come on my screen and I don't have the proper things, uh, for example, Ahmaud Arbery, I didn't even know what I was looking at until it ha and I was like, oh no, wait. And so it's like, it's like, you know, the trauma porn or the trauma, trauma. And then like, so, you know, thinking of someone like Sontag and photography and illness and different things, um, but also violence. I mean, so many, um, black artists are, are conscious of this and thinking about this, but also in language too, because that's a picture too. And so um, I'm really taking a step back before running out and, and also being mindful and thinking of certain protesters being at risk because I'm making a photograph. So now it's like, it's not just about me like getting my shot. Like I don't, I'm, I don't need to get my shot. I need to do some work and get on the page. But these are some of the things I'm thinking about with photography and video work right now as an artist. Uh, well, that was a very affecting answer. Sorry, it made me pause for a second. Uh, so our next question is from 8010, who says, thank you both so much for this conversation. You both spoke about recovering language, both as an act of breaking silence and as digesting silence as an occurrence. Can you both speak to the ways you have met silence, whether on the page or within your lives and how it has changed your perspective? Hmm. Thank you, AD. You don't, you don't come with the question. You can come all the way with the question. Wow. Um, I think silence has really changed for me since my mother died. Uh, 
I think I was much quieter before when she was alive and um, coming out of her and because she was not a quiet woman, she was not a silent woman, she would get in your face quick and read you your whole life and tell you how she felt um, with kindness, but also very directness. Um, I seem to have now internalized a bit of that in me where I'm just like, I'm just going to say it and I'll be uncomfortable. I don't care, but I'm going to say it. And when I think so much about lineage of the women and, and, and men and figures who are my art ancestors, what they risked and dared by saying it, I cannot at this point in my life not say anything. I cannot afford to look away. And so, um, you know, I do think, you know, silence, I don't think all silences are bad or, and I don't, I think they're more comp complicated and complex about when you choose silence or when you need it or you're listening and that's what the silence is about or something is fermenting in you, in your body. But I know I am now put myself on notice about being silent. I'm on notice for myself. Um, and I don't put that on other artists or other poets, but when I'm feeling silent because I'm afraid, that ain't it. I gotta do something else. So Natalie, what about you? Yeah, I, I mean, silence is, I mean, I, I'm from a very chaotic family. I grew up with a large family, but, but silence is something woven into my culture. So, uh, and it's something I feel a great, it was a great gift that my elders gave me as I worked with them um, in, it's crazy, right? I'm working to recover a language which you would uh, imagine suddenly at least the noise of the language being spoken. And yet what I learned from them is that a lot of what they were expressing was being expressed in silence. Yeah. So I think there's a way of thinking about silence as being more than just speaking or not speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and the main question I have, I, I think right now uh, about silence is, you know, especially as a poet, is that because I have written a poem doesn't necessarily mean I have spoken out against something. Um, mm. and, and I think there's something also about me really questioning, you know, turning things back to myself. Like, what does it mean to, to have spoken versus to have been heard? Or, um, you know, my main question, especially knowing, you know, that I, that I write in the English language, but I have other languages and that the English language uh, is a record of what has been done to my people and many other peoples um, mm. is I, I'm really wondering what is it, what does it require me? Who does the English language require me to become in order to speak it and to be heard? Mm. And it's an, it's an ego that I'm a little uncomfortable with. Um, and so I think I'm thinking about that. Like, what does it mean to, to be, uh, what, just what does silence even mean? Like, it's not necessarily to be quiet, um, but, you know, speaking the English language, I don't know, like, can we be heard speaking the English language? Like, is that, you know, is, will we always be silent in it in some ways uh, because of the way it was structured? So, I mean, that's an incredible question. Um, the kind of question that you feel lucky for having been asked so that you can carry it off and do something with it a bit later. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an important question. You know, what is silence? What is, uh, what is quiet? What is the public or private of either? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, and I guess we unfortunately have time for just one last question. So we're going to go with Kimberly Thornton who asks, I, it says, I loved what Natalie said about this generation and younger acting as ancestors instead of just descendants. Eliza, what would you say to your younger self as an ancestor during hard times? And Natalie, what would you say to yourself? Hmm, I'd say go home. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. I, I, I don't know. I think, uh, God, what a great question. This, this is the kind of two, two, three AM question. Um, I, 
I don't know. I don't, you know, I can't answer that actually. I think it's okay for me to say that I actually can't answer that right away. I don't, that what a profound question, but I would say, um, I do, I do feel like an ancestor and a descendant, which means there's a profound channel and vibration and frequency running through me. And in that space, I can go back through time and look at my younger self and love and care for her and hear her so that as I go forward, um, I can hear and help others who need care, love, respect, room, voice, imperfection, everything. And so the care that I might give toward my younger self or offer her allows me to come through a kind of nonlinear space towards others. And I feel that's really activated in me right now is to um, hold space with others. I think that's what I can say. And also um, as we're closing again, just thank you, Sabir. Thank you, Strand, Natalie. I love you. Thank Gracias. you. Yes, yeah, te amo. <laughs> te amo. Thank you both so much. And I uh, dropped the purchase links for both of your books in the chat. 10% uh, of all sales will go to Black Lives Matter. So if you don't already have the books, please feel free to buy them. And thank you for a powerful and amazing discussion. Thank you, Sabir. Thank yeah, you. Gracias. Thank you. Thanks.